I was sitting in a tram about six months ago, trying to think of just a justification for not leaving a seat open for an elderly person or a pregnant woman, when I came up with a pretty good one. You see, a friend of mine was standing right next to an open seat, about three rows in front of me. And I started thinking, why isn't she sitting down? Isn't sitting obviously more comfortable than standing, especially on a long journey? And then I thought, what if my friend was actually that elderly person? Would it then be okay for me to take their seat? Since they're not contesting it, that should be fine, right? And at that point, alarm bells labeled selfish ass started ringing in my head because that's not what you're supposed to think. You're, we're all taught to leave that seat for someone who really needs it more. Even though I would argue that having stood uh, half an hour in a crowded train uh, beforehand made it okay for me to sit, but I digress. Um, the point there was, what I noticed, uh, was that the same thing that stopped me uh, from thinking about that situation further was probably what made my friend not want to sit down in the first place. And that led me to the conclusion that how much we enjoy doing certain things really depends on how we think about them. And that, that's pretty subjective, but also influenced by society. And I started connecting dots, uh, looking for more and more examples of things similar to this, to see how far these changes in enjoyment could go. And what I ended up with, and what I hope to uh, convince you of today, is that you can substantially increase your happiness uh, on an everyday basis just by slightly tweaking uh, the values that you hold, because that's what it comes down to. How much you enjoy something depends, uh, in large part, uh, on how much you think that thing is good or bad. So I'll start with reasons to actually change the values that you have, because you might think, well, the values that I have are great already, and I shouldn't change them. They'll always stop you from doing that, because changing them goes against what is in them at that point. Um, so about three years ago, a faculty member from the Poznan University of Technology was giving a lecture on this very stage about how not to be a bore. And he used that phrase about 50 times. And the advice to avoid calling it orders that he gave ranged from pretty funny to downright bad for society. That's sort of my take on it, of course. Different people might think differently. But um, I'll give a few examples. Uh, some of the more funny ones were always being half a step below a woman while walking down or upstairs. Um, or not keeping your hands in your pockets. I don't really see a problem with that, but sure, I can take them out. Uh, another one was always dressing appropriately. That one sort of applies today. I would have worn that sweater, but I wasn't allowed to, sadly. I was, I was cold all day. Um, but the more negative ones were opening doors for people. That seems good, right? They don't have to open the door. But when you do that, if the door goes inside, you're standing there, you're creating a bottleneck, so if there's a lot of people behind you, there's much less throughput. And if the door opens backwards, then you're slowing down that whole column of people uh, for at least five seconds. And the sort of main problem that I have is that this set of rules isn't very consistent. Because on the other hand, you have something like escalator etiquette, which is standing on the right side and giving people who want to walk uh, space on the left side. But it turns out that manufacturers discourage that practice because it makes the load uneven on that escalator, so it needs more frequent repairs. And if it isn't repaired, the escalator can just break and kill people. Falling in, that's pretty bad, right? So uh, all of this is to say that the rules that we're taught aren't always the best, which means that changing them shouldn't always be bad. Now uh, we need another piece of the puzzle, which is that the things we believe to be good don't actually have to be related to the material world, because you could argue that all of these ethical things or sort of societal norms that I mentioned earlier, they make some sort of sense in some way. But uh, if you look at people who go to church or pray to God, I I'm not judging, that's totally fine for them, because they gain a lot of enjoyment from doing that. But someone who doesn't believe and would go to church has a totally different internal reaction to the same experience. So in 
that's sort of immaterial. That's all in your head, pretty much, your belief and how that changes. And people really are uh, very fulfilled by going to church and praying and doing what they feel is good. Um, another maybe more negative aspect of that is how cult leaders manipulate um, the people that they are manipulating into doing things that they would never do just by subtly tweaking what they value. And then they end up doing really terrible things. So we've talked about people having different reactions to the same experience, but now we can talk about people having the same experience, but from uh, having different experiences, but the same reaction. Um, and for that example, I would use shoes. We can sort of find two groups. Uh, of course, there are more, but these are like the two um, extreme ones. One group of people wears the same shoes for 15 years, and they're really proud of uh, how resourceful and sort of uh, sustainable they are. And the other group buys the most expensive shoes and shows them off. I'm, you can guess which group I prefer. <laughs> but um, the point there is both types of shoes probably aren't the most comfortable and the most appropriate for every occasion. And yet, in both groups, uh, those people will enjoy wearing them. And if they switch shoes, even if they were objectively the same size inside, they might feel uh, less comfortable in the ones that they don't like because of the values that they assign to themselves. And now we'll move on to another thing. That's um, that the happiness is actually real. Because up until this point, you might say, well, all of these reactions that people have they're just masking internally or just lying to themselves. They're not actually happy and fulfilled. And to that, I have one word, which is pets. They are, from a material perspective, a waste of time and resources. And uh, a lot of people who have pets right now are pretty angry <laughs> in their heads because how could I say that their precious pig, dog, or hyena is uh, useless? But I didn't say that. I said that from a material perspective, they're a waste of time and resources. That doesn't mean that internally, they don't give you a great deal of happiness and fulfillment, which that reaction that a lot of you had, it, it proves my point that you really feel attached to your, to your own pets. Now, we'll need one last thing, which is that the way we enjoy things can change over time. It's one thing learning a value system as a child, but it's another changing it later on. And for this, we can use a tastes of food, but also taste in other things, as I'll get to. Um, if someone wants to become vegan, they might not initially like the type of food, but after thinking that it will be good for them, or at least good for the environment or animals, any, th any justification that they provide for themselves will make the food taste better. Um, the same can go for people changing their tastes in movies or music. You might have liked something earlier, but due to some sort of a uh, scandal about uh, a director or a main actor, you might boycott the film. Even though you used to like it, you'll stop liking it because you'll associate that negatively and feel that that's something that you should do. So you totally can change uh, these values that you have. And now with all of these examples, the fact that it is true happiness, the fact that um, you can change it, that sometimes you should change it, um, also that it doesn't have to be related to the real world and you have a large choice in what it can be, we can apply that to real life. It, one example is sleep and work. Sleep is, from a health perspective, definitely much more important than work. Yet some people really prioritize work. Like, they'll work all night and then it turns out that the quality of their work diminishes, but the f good feeling that they get from working makes them not even notice that. So for them, changing their values to value sleep more will probably make them work better. They just don't see that with the current rule set that they have. Um, originally, I was going to end on this uh, because I just went to sleep. Um, but I, I finished. I, I added some more. You can really apply this to almost anything. To sport, uh, you might not like exercising, but if you think of it as something that is good for you, not only will you start doing it and start liking it, it will also bring actual health benefits. And just as a disclaimer, this is not a panaceum. It's not something that can solve depression and addiction and a whole host of others. 
It's just a fine adjustment knob to a well-balanced mind. 